Good afternoon. Welcome to my lecture recital entitled Franz Schubert's Use of Harmony to Express the Text as His Musical Settings of Franz Grillparzer's Poetry. This topic became a focus of interest for me because of an affinity for poetry and obsession with harmony. 20 plus years of accompanying singers on Schubert Leader and the discovery of the extended work Miriam Ziegeskazan. Intent and Scope. Although the music and life of Franz Peter Schubert has generated an abundance of research, relatively little has been written about his German text to secular choral settings. Although Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Franz Joseph Haydn, and Ludwig von Beethoven commonly are considered the first Viennese school, in fact, all three were Viennese transplants. Schubert was a first generation native of Vienna who never moved permanently from the city. This fact alone has given musicologists much to ponder, as many facets of the city had a major impact on his music, including the development of Lieder as a legitimate art form, for which scholars largely give credit to Schubert. Though his Lieder have been extensively studied, little scholarship has been dedicated to his core works with poetic texts, which are rel related to his Lieder. To begin to fill this lacuna, the following st study focuses on two German texted choral settings by Schubert. Stenchen and Miriam Siegeskazan, and the solo, Berthes Lied in der Nacht. These three pieces, all types of songs, comprise the total of Schubert settings featuring texts by Franz Grillparzer. Grillparzer was a respected Viennese poet and dramatist who also had ties to Beethoven, Clara Wieck, Franz Liszt, Felix Mendelssohn, and others. During Schubert's lifetime, however, he alone set the poet's words to music. The text of Werther's Lied in der Nacht, Werther's Song in the Night, was intended for Grillparzer's 1817 play Die Anfrau, in which Werther lulls her father to sleep. Although the poem was cut from the play, Schubert composed the musical setting, D653, for soprano and piano in 1819. Schubert's part song Stenchen, Serenade, D920, was composed in 1827 and is a popular piece with two settings, one for TTBB forces, alto, solo, and piano, and another for treble voices, alto, solo, and piano. The text is a serenade of love, and the music was written for a garden performance to celebrate the birthday of Louise Gossmer, a wealthy student of Anna Frilich. Schubert and Grillparzer met through their mutual acquaintance of the four Frilich sisters, who are gifted musicians and close friends to both. The cantata Miriam Ziegesgesang, Miriam's Victory Song, D942, for SATB chorus, soprano, solo, and piano, was composed in 1828, a few months before Schubert died. It is the most extensive of the three Grill Parser settings. The cantata is based on the Old Testament Exodus story in which Miriam leads the Israelites in celebration after their deliverance from the Egyptians via the parting of the Red Sea. The score is divided into six sections of music. Much of it is written in a spirit of leader with lyric solo melodies over a supportive accompaniment. Like Stenchen, all but one section is a call and response between solo and chorus, though with greater imitative writing in the chorus and piano. The cantata ends with an extensive fugue. Schubert struggled under the shadow of Beethoven, who also lived in Vienna. This is part of the dichotomy of Schubert's life and output. Only one of his symphonies and string quartets was published during his lifetime, although these were genres for which Beethoven was well known. Most of Schubert's poet friends held other positions and revered him for his innovation in song, but could do little to promote his status in the serious genres. Nor did most think Schubert's output in these genres worthy. Despite this, Schubert wrote and studied the standard genres of the first Viennese school. In addition to his nine symphonies, he wrote six masses, three of which contain extensive fugal writing at the end of the Gloria. He displayed a renewed passion for counterpoint towards the end of his life, evidenced by his study of George Friedrich, Friedrich Handel's oratorios. And just before his death, his single lesson was Simon Zechter the reputed composer of fugues. 
Schubert composed Miriam Siegesgesang as an homage to Handel and arguably an indirect homage to Beethoven. Schubert, like Beethoven, serves as a bridge between classical and romantic ideals. Beethoven is considered a model of formal transformation for romantic composers who follow it. Donald Grout writes, quote, Schubert's symphonies follow regular classic forms, and if they are considered romantic, it is by virtue of the music's lyricism, its adventurous harmonic excursions, and its enchanting colors, end quote. This study will not be concerned with Schubert's treatment of sonata form or his place as a classicist or a romantic but will explore his use of these adventurous harmonic excursions and enchanting colors as an expression of the text. Although some initial comparisons between Beethoven, Schubert, and Handel have to be made, the main purpose of this study is to demonstrate that in his choral works, as in his songs, Schubert uses harmony to illustrate the content of his text, to create particular moods, and to remind the listener of recurrent elements in poetry. Grove Music Online defines motive as, quote, a short musical idea, melodic, rhythmic, harmonic, or any combination of these, end quote. Harmonic motive denotes the use of harmony as a musical idea, especially in a recurring context. In a 2009 article on the functions of har harmony and Schubert, uh, harmony and Schubert works, Brian Black describes harmonic motives as examples of tonal illusion with three different functions, referential, modulatory, and gestural. A referential harmonic motive interprets a stable harmony as a foreshadowing or reflection of events or tonal centers, which helps to solidify the structural tonal centers of a work. A modulatory harmonic motive illuminates the tonal possibilities within modulation. It is usually an unstable chord, such as a diminished seventh, that can be repurposed to lead to various tonal centers, or a cell of sub subsequent harmonies which can be transposed to accomplish tonal variety. A gestural harmonic motive serves as a unique expression that invokes strong emotions or colors with each occurrence. This could be accomplished through its idiosyncrasies of voice leading or its prolongation for dramatic effect. By focusing primarily on Schubert's treatment of harmony, the intention is to shed new light on an aspect of his expressive language and formal construction that has been neglected in the scholarly literature. Statement of primary thesis. In this study, I will demonstrate that Franz Schubert used harmony as both a micro and a macro expression of the text in three musical settings of poetry by Franz Gurlparte. Review of scholarly literature. Out of a large corpus of Schubert biographies, those by Maurice J. Brown, Alfred Einstein, and Otto Erich Deutsch are frequently referenced in Schubert's scholarship. Deutsch's authoritative biography was the first comprehensive study of primary sources pertaining to Schubert's life and brought a host of new material to light when it was first published in 1914. Deutsch also is responsible for the chronological cataloging of Schubert's works, hence the D number in his well-known thematic catalog. In his article on the composer for the New Grove, Robert Winter writes, uh, Robert Winter offers a whirlwind of detail specific on Schubert's life. The latter half of the article is devoted to Schubert's style, including his innovations in song. According to Winter, quote, Schubert's uniqueness lay not only in his raising the leap from a marginal to a central genre, but his ability to fuse poetry and music in ways that seem not only unique, but inevitable, end quote. Along with Schubert's noted lyricism and rhythmic ingenuity, Winter comments on Schubert's progressive chromaticism, modeled on Mozart, but at times foreshadowing Richard Wagner. Ernest G. Porter devotes separate chapters to key, harmony, and modulation in Schubert's song technique. Consider the opening paragraph of chapter three, key, quote, Schubert's sense of note relationship, whether in melody or harmony, was extraordinarily keen, and of all notes, he held the median as the most expressive. It was, of course, the means of major minor transformation, which is so, such a characteristic of his work. But it was much more than this. His melodies so often revolve around that note, rising to it in conjunct or disjunct motion, using it as a climax or as an initial opening of a fresh phrase, or making it a pivot for modulation. In all the greater songs, the third of almost every chord seems to be placed with loving care. And regardless of the ordinary diatonic scale, it is turned into a major or minor interval according to his feeling for the word or phrase in the song." End quote. The implications for the median are multifaceted. This scale degree plays the most prominent role in text painting, at least in Porter's so-called greater songs, and determines the major minor parallel shifts for which Schubert is famously known. It also has structural implications as a catalyst for emotional climax, modulation, or the beginning of a new thought. Much of the harmonic emphasis in Schubert's song technique is connected to expression of the text. 
This is on both the micro level, such as word painting, and macro level, such as ending in a higher key than the beginning to express emotional content of the poetry. In a 1986 essay, Lawrence Kramer references Porter in confirming this aspect, along with the transformational powers the elite had on classical restrictions. Quote, the traditional way to explain why the elite in particular should form the breakthrough genre is to observe that structural looseness and harmonic irregularity can be persuasively justified as expressions of the text, end quote. This thought is important in establishing form and harmony as expressions of the text. Susan Ewan supports the idea that Schubert engaged in word painting on the micro and macro level. Her examples from Schubert's leader are beautifully expressed and tie the harmony and other musical elements to localized textual expression. Her analysis of Bertha's Lied in der Nacht is similar to what I am calling tonal illusion. Like Porter, Ewens emphasizes Schubert's propensity for immediate relationships, his common tone modulations, and his affinity for shifting between parallel keys. I will provide more specific harmonic detail in my analysis. In addition to harmonic expression of individual musical phrases or moments, numerous scholars have observed that Schubert also used recurrent harmonic material in large-scale expression. Tonal illusion is famously described in Edward T. Cohn's article, Schubert's Promissory Note, an Exercise in Musical Hermeneutics. In his article, Cohn explores, explores the expected resolution of an E natural in measures 7 through 8 and its varied role throughout Momo Musical, Opus 94, number 6. Cohn establishes the structural significance of a particular scale degree, coined the term promissory note, to interpret localized meaning, meaning as a musical whole, and meaning as a reflection of Schubert's state of being and possible intent. Cohn's classic article is an example of tonal illusion through the denied and fulfilled expectations of the resolution of a single scale degree, flat submedia. This article laid new groundwork for scholastic interpretation of other works and methods. James William Sabasky presents seven sacred works written by Schubert in the last year of his life in contextual processes in Schubert's late sacred music. He bases his analysis on Cohn's promissory note, revealing how each work undergoes a contextual process in which Schubert, quote, initiates a logical progression or introduces a musical problem in order to portray its pursuit and solution, end quote. This generally involves the early introduction of striking harmony and scale degrees, whose teleological functions are obscured until close to the end of the piece. In contrast to the lamentative mood of Schubert's earlier work, Sabasky posits that these later sacred works reveal the spiritual hope Schubert may have been expressing toward his God in the last months of his life. Although Sabasky might argue that Miriam Siegesgesang aligns with Schubert's spiritual hope, it is beyond the scope of this paper to demonstrate hermeneutical interpretation. I do hope to demonstrate how this cantata presents a musical problem in the form of a harmonic motive whose teleological fulfillment is an expression of the text. Joseph Kerman details some striking uses of chromatic chords in the piano introductions of Schubert's song cycle Schwanesgesang, D957. These chords are used to set mood, describe the scene, foreshadow a crucial descriptive moment in the work, and as gestures that are, that are, quote, poetic and illustrative, end quote. None of Carmen's examples are Gropars's text, but they demonstrate how tonal illusion harmonic motives are used in piano introductions to foreshadow the textual meaning and return to deepen that expression. As referenced earlier, Brian Black's scholarship describes harmonic motives as referential, modulatory, and gestural. Black offers one example of his methodology's application to leader in an analysis of the Jung Nom, D828, which I will use as a model. Black ends his article by demonstrating how a single harmonic motive can function as all three types using a movement from the string quartet in D minor, Der Tod und das Mädchen, D810. In conjunction with the ideas on tonal illusion presented in the articles above, I will demonstrate how Black's referential, modulatory, and gestural harmonic motives apply to Schubert's Gropparser settings. In Gratus ad Parnassum, Beethoven, Schubert, and the Romance of Counterpoint, Richard Kramer includes Miriam Siegesgesang in criticizing some of Schubert's fugal writing as, quote, tacked on. Kramer asserts that Schubert valued fugal writing only for its, quote, historical restoration, end quote, and that Schubert's famous counterpoint lesson with Simon Zechter initiated from Schubert's recognition of his own shortcomings and from an attempt to be like Beethoven. Most of Schubert's counterpoint was composed before this single lesson in 1828, so the lesson can tell us little except Schubert's desire to improve in that regard. 
Kramer criticizes Schubert on his adherence to the 18th century, but ironically, his marks against Schubert's cantata are from an 18th century perspective on the discipline. Schubert's counterpart may not have the intricate inevitability of Bach infused Beethoven, as Kramer summarizes, but hope to demonstrate that the fugal ending of Miriam Siegesgesang is a culmination of the work and not simply a tack on homage. Only a small amount of scholarship has rendered specific analysis of these works. Aaron Carter Cohn's thesis compares Miriam Ziegesgesang to Henry's Israel and Egypt. Carter Cohn makes interesting observations regarding the two composers' musical paintings of the Parting of the Red Sea. The author, author also comments on the French overture and fugal writing as Handelian tributes. Stephen Norris Holcomb's document analyzes Miriam Ziegesgesang with regard to its form, texture, timbre, rhythm, melody, and harmony. Because the document describes all of the essential musical elements of several works, it only offers a few pages on the harmonic implications. Donald Quant surveys the part songs of Franz Schubert, but only three measures of stension are analyzed. Donald Baumas analyzes the phrase structure of stension, but the Roman numeral analysis is only, repre uh, only represents basic harmonic activity. Maurice Brown is one of the authors of the New Grove online article on Schubert, and his separate essay on Schubert's part songs helped shape my methodology. In this essay, Brown gives an overview of Schubert's part songs for male voices with specific examples of harmonic expression of the text, mostly surrounding key centers and chord qualities. These extend from micro levels of word painting to macro levels of mood, scene, or symbol. Brown remarks on Schubert's propensity to shift tonal centers or chord roots by descending half steps many times as expressions of the text. Methodology. The uniqueness of Miriam Ziegesgesang and the schubert grillparzer beethoven connection initially drew me into this project. Grillparzer gave the oration at Beethoven's funeral in 1727, which thousands of Viennese attended and for which Schubert was a torchbearer. A little more than a year later, Schubert lay on his deathbed, deathbed as musicians played Beethoven's string quartet in C-sharp minor, opus 131, at his request. Days later, Schubert was in the ground, very close to Beethoven, again at his request. Grillparzer, who had spoken at Beethoven's funeral the previous year, penned Schubert's elusive epitaph, quote, the art of music here entombed a rich possession, but even far fairer hopes, end quote. The bulk of Schubert's music was not publicly performed, published, published or adequately recognized until after his death, including Miriam Ziegesgesang. The cantata was intended for Schubert's concert of his own music in 1828 on the anniversary of Beethoven's death, but ironically, it premiered in 1829 at a concert organized by Schubert's friends to raise money for Schubert's gravestone. Although there is no extant documentation for the premiere of Bertha's Lied in der Nacht, it likely was included on one of the many Schubertiades hosted by Joseph von Schwaun or another of Schubert's friends, such as the four Friedrich sisters. Stension, commissioned by Anna Friedrich, was selected by Schubert as one of the works performed on his 1828 program in which Josephine Froelich sang the solo. The significance here is that all three works were deeply connected to Schubert's circle of friends and grew out of a specific poet from the circle, and that two of the works were commendable enough to Schubert for him to select them for his 1828 performance. As a conductor, singer, and pianist, I hope to offer analytic specificity to substantiate these works as expressive gems of the concert repertoire. I will use the text harmony connections of Schubert's leader and part songs as described by Ewens, Porter, Brown, and Sebasti to help shape my analysis. I will also use the scholarship on tonal illusion to inform harmonic expression of the text, especially the ideas of harmonic motive by Ryan Black. Tonal illusion, contextual process, and harmonic motive are all terms related to the same idea of harmony's recurrence and frequent transformation to achieve structural and tonal goals ultimately connected to the thematic and expressive ideas of the text. Chromatic chords and harmonic motives are key to the text expression and stension. To illustrate, consider the first five measures. Stension is an F major. The most interesting harmonies in the first phrase occur in measure two. A borrowed supertonic half diminished seventh chord is followed by a secondary leading tone chord, both tonicizing the dominant seventh chord in the first conversion. Both of these chords use the lowered third scale degree and occur at the peak of the first dynamic swell from measure one to two. The harmonic rhythm increases in measure three as the first cadential progression resolves in elision with the piano vocal entrance. This is the beginning of the, quote, tenderness, end quote, of the work by, described by Oscar B. The piano introduction poignantly sets the mood of the soft serenade and prepares the soloist's initial entrance on the word serga, hesitant. The soloist's entrance on the diatonic third scale degree, 
is notably a semitone higher than the lower third in my measure two, borrowed from the parallel minor. This commences the importance of major minor interplay and the median scale degree so described by Ewens and Porter. In measure five, the chorus immediately repeats the text of the soloist, but at a pianissimo dynamic, further emphasizing the soft hesitancy of the text. The one to five progression of the soloist is repeated in the chorus, but as a tonicization of the dominant. Once again, Schubert ushers in the lowered median, this time with C major. Consider the foreshadowing already taking place. The borrowed A flat for measure two is also a tonicization of C minor, the key to which the chorus temporarily turns in its first entrance as it echoes the soloist's music and text. Musical example one. While more could be said about local details, the fully diminished chord in measure two displays deeper structural significance. According to Black, a gestural harmonic motive possesses an emotional, quote, an emotional quality that colors the movement with each of the motive's returns, end quote. This unstable diminished seventh chord re returns several times in a gestural capacity as part of a harmonic cell resolving to C major or C minor. In measure 45, it occurs over an E-flat pedal on the words, Liebe spricht, love speaks. And in measures 48 and 50, it occurs in first inversion on Freunden, friend. Eugene Porter references two uses of the diminished seventh chord as, quote, tender, end quote. One is used to express the word, express the word mute at the close, or tired, at the close of day in Der Winterabend. Another depicts the words zu leiden, to suffer, at the end of Der Heimweg. The diminished seventh chord extension depicts another familiar kind of tenderness, one of love. Musical example two. According to Black, quote, in their referential role, harmonic motives create a web of tonal illusions that foreshadow or recall specific keys or events in the movement, end quote. In measure 52, Schubert uses the diminished seventh chord to color the word Liebchen, little deer, as the friends try to gently arouse the darling from sleep. Schubert clouds the function in measure two, however, as the resolution to a C minor triad is cloaked with F pedal tones. The diminished seventh chord carries dual functions as a secondary leading tone chord to C minor and as a common tone diminished seventh chord of a 5-9 in B-flat major. In this way, the harmonic cell acts as both a gestural and reverential harmonic motive. It both recalls the text and mood of measures 1 through 6 and is repurposed in the key of the subdominant in measures 45, 48, and 52 to offer a stable close in a major key to conclude the first main music and poetical idea. The mood set in the first five measures of the part song foreshadows the emotion expressed with each repetition of the same diminished seventh chord. While the core of the harmonic motive remains consistent in measures 2, 45, 48, and 52, each approach to and resolution from the diminished seventh chord is slightly altered, representing the variations of four distinct words bearing similar connotations, zergent, liebe, freunden, and liebchen, respectively. Musical example three. Grill Parser's poem, Berth des Lied in der Nacht, is 16 lines evenly divided into four stanzas. Schubert's musical setting divides the stanzas into two sections with a total of 27 measures. As Ewens describes, quote, the poem is a small, lovely thing in which night and sleep are personified, 
Night as a creature with gently moving giant wings that envelop the hills and valleys. Sleep as an adorable child who whispers to the sleeper, end quote. Night and sleep are separate personifications coinciding with the two formal sections of music. But just as the coming of night accompanies the coming of sleep, Schubert's setting blurs the musical and literary lines between these ideas, exploiting their parallel nature through the contextual process of tonal illusion. Schubert's, quote, practice of stating the principal musical material in the piano introduction, end quote, holds true in Berthe's Lied in der Nacht, even though the piano introduction is a mere two measures in length. As Ewens notes, quote, the two-measure piano introduction is divided in half, the first measure in a unison texture and the second harmonized, culminating in a half cadence on the dominant of E-flat minor, end quote. Measure two begins with a deceptive resolution and brief Thomasization of C-flat major, but Schubert uses a German augmented six to return to the dominant of E-flat minor at the end of the measure. Ewens explains, quote, the effect of the semitone motion upwards from the unharmonized B-flat at the end of measure one, heightened by its leading tone to the C-flat major chord at the beginning of measure two, six is upper neighbor to five, continues the rising motion as if night were spreading outwards and upwards, enveloping more of the musical landscape, end quote. Musical example four. The chromatic scale in the tenor on beats three and four of measure two foreshadows coming material. Ewens makes note of this chromatic scale, but only in its currents in the second section of music. Quote, Schubert attenuates an ostinato so as to remove almost every trace of tension and render it rolling. Only when the, when the poet invokes eyes wakeful from sorrow does Schubert introduce a rising chromaticism in the tenor part, measure 13, end quote. The chromatic scale mentioned by Ewens is an augmentation of the scale in measure two. The Algen music of the text, Eyes Wakeful from Sorrow, can also be heard through the chromatic rise in the piano made heavy by its rhythmic augmentation and the persistency of the C-sharp ostinato. Ewens and Porter both describe the ostinato as, quote, murmuring, end quote, and Porter goes further in ascribing it, quote, soporific power, end quote, in the second section. The scale and turn figure of measure two allude back to measure one and forward to measure 13, but the harmony of measure two foreshadows the musical material to come in significant and extraordinary ways. The harmonic cell of a first inversion G-flat major minor seventh chord to a reposition C-flat major triad, beat two, and the downbeat of beat three in measure two, returns in measures 19 through 24. Schubert's temporary tonicization of C-flat major in me measure 2, the submedian of E-flat minor, is rendered as the tonicization of B major in measure 19, the enharmonic equivalent of C-flat major, and the subdominant of F-sharp major. As Brian Black notes, quote, the gestural function that harmonic motives fulfill is the most direct of the three, for it makes tonal harmonic references emotionally palpable. In general, motives working in this capacity are harmonic cells. There are two aspects to consider. The cell's distinctive configuration of voice leading, which in itself creates an emotional response in the listener, and the effective significance that the operations of the cell give to the tonalities involved, end quote. This emotional palpability is emphasized through a gestural harmonic motive repeated and varied over the course of six measures, a significant portion of the song's 27. A close examination of the voice leading between measures 2 and 19 reveals almost identical treatments with measure 19 expanded by an octave. The C-flat chord of measure two, which Ewens described as night extending outwards and upwards, is now repeatedly tonicized with the text, alles dick schlummer, literally all cover slumber, further emphasized through modal mixture in measures 23 through 24. The gestural harmonic motive mentioned above makes parallel the central themes of night and sleep. Night's extension outward over the landscape in measure two is reciprocated as restfulness of sleep, a kind of human extension inward, if you will, in measures 19 through 27. The soprano melody in these measures reiterates the turn figure from a piano introduction to further connect the ideas of night and sleep and the effective significance of the harmonic motive. 
musical example five. Schubert establishes harmonic motives in each section of Miriam Zikes Gesang that also play elusive roles in the cantata as a whole. Scholars such as Stephen Nor Norris Holcomb have mentioned the overdotting Handelian figure that occurs as a predominant feature in the piano introduction of the work. Perhaps more important to the work's genesis and construction are the only chromatic harmonies outside of C major which occur in measure four, a first inversion B major triad and the root position B major minor seventh chord that follows function as secondary dominance to E minor. These chords are not only striking because of their one measure interruption of a diatonic progression, but also because of a tritone leap in the bass to B sharp in measure four and interruption of a diatonic walking bass. Musical example six. The gestural harmonic motive from measure 4 to 5 returns in an expanded form in measures 19 through 21 in a vocal solo and piano texture that is repeated by the chorus in measures 24 through 26. Each iteration of the B major triad cor corresponds with the words Herr and Zeiten, Lord and Time. The material tonicizing E minor returns to C major via a chromatic median relationship between a B major triad and a G major minor seventh chord in measures 21 and 26. Holcomb references this particular instance of harmony's relationship to the text. Quote, very often his choice of chord or harmonic structure will correspond to textual or textural emphasis. For example, in section 1, measures 20 through 21, the key of E minor has been established in cadences on the dominant seventh chord. But in order to emphasize the word hoita, today, Schubert suddenly inserts a G major seventh chord that pulls the listener abruptly back to the tonic C major, end quote. The chromatic meaning juxtaposes the words time and today while maintaining the common tone B, showing a relationship between the Lord of all time and the Lord of today. Musical example seven. The principal harmonic motive of section four is right with imagery. The harmonic cell functions, functioning as a gestural harmonic motive is so pervasive that it constitutes the majority of the total musical material. This harmonic cell, sevenfold diminished seven to five seven to one, is initiated each time by the unexpected insertion of the submediate scale degree. The motive is introduced at the end of section three to foreshadow the approaching literary and musical material. The text of section three concerns the helplessness of the Israelites as they are pursued by Pharaoh and his army through the parted Red Sea. Section three, however, ends with the words, Velk zorisem, veil, murmen, drenen, hur, sturm. Literally, what rustling, contractions, murmur, roar, listen, storm. An F sharp major triad rises to a G major triad on the word drenen, roar, in measure 227 undermined by an A-flat upper neighbor. The use of A-flat allows Schubert to transition into a seven fully diminished seven in C minor in measure 228. The chorus sings the word Sturm on a G major chord in measure 229, the last measure of section three, and repeats the word on a fortissimo C minor triad in the first measure of section four, setting up a dominant tonic relationship and completing the harmonic motive. 
musical example eight. The harmonic motive occurs seven times in its complete form in section four. A fragment of the motive occurs in measures 251 as major six and F sharp minor is used as a dominant pivot chord in G minor. The appearance of the D major triad correlates with the leap of a minor six in the choral bass and the introduction of the word tot, dead. Once tot is introduced in G minor, Schubert ceases to modulate, marking the finality of the death of Pharaoh and his army. The last two iterations of the motive are the most dramatic. Schubert varies the harmonic cell by replacing the sevenfold of diminished seven with a major six chord followed by a Neapolitan chord, both in root position. The choral bass again leaps up by minor six to a high E flat on the word tot before it converges with the choral soprano on A flats two octaves apart in measure 256 and again in measure 262. The Neapolitan chord built on A flat alludes to Schubert's use of the pitch at the end of section three to construct the first harmonic motive in C minor. Thus, the variation of the last harmonic motive in G minor recalls the introduction of the first harmonic motive in C minor, and the submediate scale degree is repurposed as the lowered second scale degree. Porter speaks of the use of secondary dominance, Neapolitan chords, and fully diminished seventh chords in other stormy songs written by Schubert. In Der Strom, secondary dominance are used to, quote, maintain the pressure onto the final cadence in the tempestuous introduction, end quote. And he cites the Neapolitan chord occurring on the text Unmuti Unmutik Rolz, Displease, Rolls On, as, quote, the most powerful use of the chord, end quote. Porter also renders power to fully diminished seventh chords to, quote, express the misty scene of damp winds and gray waves, end quote, in Die Stadt. Holcomb notes the strong resolution of the dominant seventh on the downbeat as, quote, repeating pattern, end quote and describes their arpeggiated rhythms as contributing to the storminess of section three. The arpeggiated rhythms, the tension and release of the chords, the rise and fall of the piano and vocal lines, and the marked crescendo occurring to almost every fort tonic chord, all on the downbeats, contribute to the visual image of repeated crashing waves. The harmonic motive then provides two purposes. It is used to depict specific words and phrases of the text, such as Ein gewickelt in Netz der Gefahr, literally wrapped in network the danger, in measures 239 through 245. It also acts as a symbol for the almost seamless repetition of the waves of the storm and the falling wall of water. There, has, there is perhaps numerological significance as there are seven complete iterations of the harmonic motive and 12 authentic cadences if we can include the tonic chord that initiates section four. Seven tw and 12 are well-known numbers of completeness and divinity in the Old Testament but this may be going beyond Schubert's intent. It is clear, however, that the harmony does much more than carry the phrase. It is central to the meaning of the text. Within the first 32 measures of music in section one, Schubert introduced median relationships between chords and tonal centers, tonicizations of E minor and F major, a parallel shift between G major and G minor, and the principal harmonic motive, all of which play significant elusive roles within the first section of music and across the entirety of the cantata. The sequence in F major foreshadows the tonal center of the second movement, a pastoral homage to Handel, which speaks of the Lord as shepherd, guiding the Israelites to the parted Red Sea. The parallel shift from G major to G minor, accompanied by an accident in the piano on the words, Bros der Herr, Great the Lord, in measures 14 through 15, foreshadows the greatness of the Lord displayed in cascading G minor waves as Pharaoh and his army are buried beneath the sea in section 4. The principal harmonic motive, which tonicizes E minor in measure 5, returns in full force in section 5, as Miriam and the Israelites commemorate the demise of Pharaoh in E minor. In section 3 in C minor, Pharaoh and his army threaten the Israelites. The piano introduction to section 3, however, is void of the median scale degree, and only when Miriam sings of the horizon darkening does Schubert introduce the E flat. It is important to note that the third of the B7 chord of the principal harmonic motive of measure 4 is also the median of C minor inharmonically spelled as E flat. Perhaps even more significant is the dynamic climax of section three, when the threat of Pharaoh seems inescapable, tonicizing eight measures of C flat major, inharmonic with the B major chord of the harmonic motive. 
Thus, the introduction to the work signals overarching tonalities and is dripping with elusive gestures. The gestural harmonic mode of the section one culminates in section six, six in a gestural, referential, and modulatory role. Section six begins by repeating the 32 measure introduction of section one. Bookending a work with the same material is a common practice, prompting the listener that the end is near. A comparison of the text from both 32 measure sections reveals Rut die Symbol, stir the symbol, in section one, and Drum mit Symbol, therefore with symbols, in section six. A slight variation to mark the conclusion of the story and prompt the Israelites to increase their praise to God at remembrance of their victory. Thus, Schubert concludes with an extended, extensive choral fugue. The fugue subject and total answer are outlined by Holcomb, who also notes Schubert's use of numerous counter melodies instead of a clear counter subject. The tenor's tonal answer results in the introduction of the dominance leading tone to measure 405. This F sharp is preceded by an E flat only a beat earlier in the bass counter melody. Schubert's first chromatic pitches in the fugue are the same as his first chromatic pitches in the introduction to section 1. These allusions to the harmonic motive are realized as an Italian augmented 6 in measure 429, leading into six measures of B major, harmonies, B major harmonies embellished by second inversion triads, sortandos on the downbeats, and the octave drops in the piano amidst a choral bass that reiterates a pedal tone on the pitch B. The ver this version of the harmonic motive, initiated by an augmented 6 chord, first appears in measure 35 of section 1 on the text Schlock die Zeiten, Strike the Harp Strings, and appears in section 6 on the words for all Zeit, for all time. Schubert thus makes a referential connection in form and a gestural connection, marking eternal praise to the Lord on strings, a pun on the word Zeiten and Zeit. Rather than resolve to the expected E minor in measure 436, Schubert resolved deceptively to C major, using the harmonic motive in a modulatory role. This deviation for the original harmonic motive is perhaps the quintessence of the entire work, a B major triad's half-step re resolution up to C major. Musical example nine. Even so, Schubert is not finished utilizing the pitches of the harmonic motive. After an extensive dominant prolongation beginning in measure 456, the tonic C major appears in measures 464 through 466. The upper voices briefly are tacit after that as E flat suddenly occurs in the upper range of the choral bass and converges with E flat tremolos in the piano on Sorzando. Like in measures 405 through 406, Schubert fashions another immediate succession of the pitches E flat and F sharp in the outer voices as a German augmented six chord in measure 467 resolves to a 5 of 5 in C major and 468. A dramatic authentic cadence sounds in measure 471, but Schubert repurposes the pitches F sharp and E flat in one final extended phrase. The bass repeatedly descends from C to F sharp in a linear tritone as the soprano repeatedly rises from C to E flat in a linear minor third in measures 471 through 473, a motive that is simultaneously inverted in the tenor. In measure 473, Schubert resolves the bass down by half step to F natural, transforming a fully diminished seventh chord into a German augmented six. The E flat that was part of a German augmented six chord in measure 467 is now part of a different German augmented six chord in measure 472 in which the soprano rises by half step to the E natural as the bass sinks to the E natural, the diatonic medium. The resolution to E major in measure 474 references E minor, the second chord of the overarching harmonic motive, before completing a circle progression to C major to end the work. Herein is Schubert's genius. Schubert introduces a seemingly insignificant chromatic harmony in measure 4 that will play out in multiple ways throughout the work, culminating in the finale. If ever T. Cohn can infer that the varied resolution of flats and median in Momo Musical, Opus 94, number 6, is symbolic of Schubert's struggle with syphilis and impending death, it is no stretch to infer the lowered medians rise to E natural, working together with the harmonic motive, as the Lord's greatness in victory over Pharaoh and the Exodus story. It is interesting that throughout Miriam Zika's Gesang, Pharaoh, Pharaoh is denied the key of C major, reserved only for the Lord's greatness. 
While the harmonic mode of the measures four through five undermines C major and is used to depict either Pharaoh's apparent triumph in section three or his demise in section five, it is also used to depict the Lord's greatness through all time. Rather than create two equal opposing forces, forces Schubert has only placed tonal limitations on Pharaoh and his army. Since Miriam Zika's song is a reflection of what God has already done, it is fitting that it begins and ends in C major, making the ultimate rise to the final diatonic median an inevitability, inevitability and a reason for the Israelites' ecstatic celebration. Conclusion. Harmony has been underplayed in its motivic role, and in fact, in some sources, the night does not even appear in the definition of motive. In the Grillparzer works described here, while melodies and rhythms do return motivically, it is not solely the solely the expected recapitulation of themes, as in sonata form, which primarily invoke emotions from the listener, but the return of harmonic motives. Some repetitions of harmonic motives are potentially clearer to the listener, as in section four, when each wave is represented by the same progression. I dare propose that the listener can hardly perceive the genesis or, re or repetition of other harmonic motives, especially if the performers are unaware of their significance. It is the responsibility of the conductor and performer to understand these tonal illusions and the relationship to the text and form. Otherwise, these harmonies are mere vehicles of local progressions and easily overlooked as insignificant. Tenuto, rubato, accent, color, dynamics, and tempo are all reasonably controlled or rather released by the conductor performer. It is with this nuance that works rise above mere exercises and musical te technique to artistry that the listener experiences as emotionally palpable whether trained or untrained in music. Schubert's epitaph, coined by Grillparzer, reads, quote, the art of music here entombed the rich possession, but even far fairer hopes. Amongst the plethora of interpretations in existence, I'd like to add my own. Hope is, by definition, not a concept one can bury and dismiss, but a present idea that represents the future. As a noun, the American Heritage Dictionary defines it as, quote, one, a desire accompanied by confident expectation, two, something hoped for, three, one that is a source of or reason for hope, end quote. An epitaph, while written for the dead, is not for the dead, but for the living. The bones of Schubert, I'm sure, would attest to his indifference to Grill Parser's words. <laughs> so perhaps while Schubert is the rich possession interred in the ground and a reason for hope, the far fairer hopes are the responsibility of the living to realize the full potential of his music. <sighs> to the members of my committee, Dr. Chamberlain, Dr. Brobeck, and Dr. Schauer, your unparalleled devotion to your students as teachers, musicians, and artists is accompanied by your genuine interest in them as people. I am astounded and truly grateful. A special thanks to Doc, who took the time to return my phone call, which started this journey, and who has been an inspiring and faithful mentor every step of the way. Worth the trip to Tucson. <laughs> to my friends and family, thank you for your encouragement and support, especially my wife and five kids, who were crazy enough to pick up and move for a year so that we could start another adventure. I love you dearly. I'd also like to thank my nephew, who is running the audiovisual equipment, my wife, who is turning pages, and my mom and sister, who make up the total number of live audience members today. <laughs> to the performers in front of you, my dear friends and colleagues, David and Michelle, and former students, Stephen, Crystal, Amanda, and Julia, who are now professionals in their own right. Thank you for committing to this with your work and talent and making a rare event these days possible. And finally, I'd like to follow in the practice of J.S. Bach, who inscribed the initials SDG, Soli Deo Gloria, at the end of many of his works, to God alone be the glory. Our performance today, mitigated by current circumstances, may be unusual for a modern mindset, but would have been commonplace in Schubert's day as friends gathered in homes to celebrate his music together, events affectionately dubbed Schubertiades. We hope you enjoy this performance of Berthes Lied in der Nacht, followed by Miriam Siegesgesang.